but uh, Rolf Biernath, and uh, I met Rolf uh, a few months ago, and he's got a ton of experience at 3M, uh, a PhD in uh, chemical engineering out of Berkeley, uh, and basically has been a product development scientist at 3M working across lots of technologies, and a lot of it I'm sure you really can't talk about, but uh, adhesives and, you know, you name it, optics in, in many different categories, but he's also gotten heavily into lean, and uh, especially in the minimal viable product, and he's going to give an overview presentation, but focusing really on minimal viable product, and, you know, so if we have a product idea, how do we get the market response to that concept without spending a lot of time and money and investing in, uh, you know, really finished prototypes and, uh, and, and all the costs that go with uh, with that whole process. So I'll turn it over to Warrow and uh, he'll enlighten us on lean and uh, how we can all develop our product concepts better, cheaper, and faster. Thank there you. Mike. Yep. Um, yeah, I also might do a mic check real quick. Is this right now? Louder? Good. Quieter? Good. Good. Okay, good. Uh, anyway, good evening, everyone. It's great to meet. Uh, Many of you, I, I'm a member here as well, but I haven't been uh, to as many as, as these as I'd like to, or I'm just really just starting, to be honest. So um, Mike was kind enough to invite me to uh, come later today. And sorry, is there some, some, some confusion? Anyway, I will be talking about minimum viable product today. It is a component of a lean startup. Uh, lean startups are uh, a very efficient way to create new businesses. And um, what I'm going to do today is talk about a little bit who I am, um, uh, lean startups versus an established firm, um, minimum viable product, and uh, then I'm going to give a word about your ideal customers as well as some examples. So first of all, who am I? Um, basically, we already kind of went through the through the spiel here. Uh, I am Berkeley grad with <coughs> chemical engineering polymer background. Um, I'd love to explore later with this battery thing to try to figure out better how that works because there's still something I, that I'm not understanding in it. But, um, uh, so uh, last uh, fall, uh, Techstars had a, had a startup weekend, which is a real compressed uh, time where teams get together to create new startup businesses. And I participated in that as probably one of the older guys there, as you see with the pictures, uh, there's a lot of teens and 20s uh, folks involved in it. Uh, but our team came in first place, and uh, it was basically, uh, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll go through a little bit of that example of what we did there, uh, in my first place. Uh, so, uh, kind of what, what have I contributed to the world? Uh, in my patents, and the one I'm most proud about, and it's currently being rolled out, and it'll probably take many years to, to roll it out, but it's an invisible um, but machine-readable coding system that uses some special films at 3M that, that basically uh, operate differently in the visible wavelengths that we're used to and in the IR that, uh, that the automated cameras use. And uh, what it does is it enables it, it enables you to put a code on pretty much darn near every kind of signage, and have the car be able to recognize that and, and use it either as a checksum or as a uh, way to actually just know this is a stop sign, even though I'm <coughs> seeing a corner of it. You know, it's blocked by a tree. Um, I can see it's coming up. So that's probably the one I'm proudest about. Uh, the <coughs> patents in microfluidics, uh, a silicon rubber replacement that we used uh, back in 1995 that saved tons and tons of landfill. Uh, it was green before green was green. Um, it, it, it replaced uh, these stamped rubber gaskets that everybody remembers uh, with basically something that was just dispensed as needed and uh, would work very well. Um, uh, also came up with an outdoor viewable TV monitor that if anybody's interested in, talk to me afterwards because I'm trying to debate whether to do a Kickstarter on that one. Um, so, established companies versus startups. What's an established company here to do? Make money, keep its investors happy, right? Keep on selling, keep on doing what it's been doing better, 
and more efficiently. Now, what's a startup to do, or a lean startup to do? Basically, it's oh, sorry, press the wrong button. Uh, its goal and sole purpose in life is to search and experiment. Once that phase is done, then it goes up and starts to become a regular company. But but the search, the startup phase, is searching and exploring and experimenting. Um, and, and basically, what do you experiment with? You try to find extreme customers. You try to find new unsolved problems uh, and come up with valuable solutions to those problems, as well as experiment with new business models. And I'll try to go through a little bit, break that down for you here as we proceed. Uh, this is new, but I kind of made an equation out of what a minimum viable product is, because I know some of you are, are engineers out there and, and, and think better that way. Um, and, and so am I. But basically, the minimum viable product is the next version of your of, of an idea that you've got um, that enables you to learn about your customers as much as you can while putting in as little effort as possible. And uh, Eric Reese uses the word effort. I kind of rephrase it here. I think of it more of an investment. So it's basically you want to maximize your learning while minimizing your investment of time, materials, and other resources um, so that you start getting customer feedback today or tomorrow rather than, than two years from today. Um, it's a tactic and the tactic is basically it, 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 the tactic being a method uh, to uh, reduce your waste of time and get in front of some visionary people <laughs> as quick as you can. And what you're you're not actually always selling the product itself, but the vision for the product. Um, and what do we mean by that? Uh, it means that, that, that basically a, a minimum viable product is not pieces of a car as you get to the car, but rather something that already offers a little bit of the functionality of what the car would offer so that they can get the vision in mind of what the ultimate product will be. Uh, for example, here we've got the skateboard, goes up to scooter, all the way up through to your car. Each of those things contains a little bit of the function, uh, so it's the usability, and gets a little bit to, to the emotional character of your product. So what it is not, is it's not about minimalism. Some people think it's always trying to come up with the minimum of everything that you can do. And that's that's not what it is. It's really about getting to the keeping your experiments simple and, and systematic. And basically it's it's a scientific method brought to new business development. Um, so you want to keep it simple. Um, it's to test your assumptions and learn facts about your um, customer, whereas uh, as opposed to all the assumptions you come in, in with. Um, and what that really means is you got to talk to your customer early. And in the inventive world, right, it's kind of scary to talk to your customers early about your ideas. And so, so there's a there's a contradiction there that, that we have to live with. But, but the simple fact is that in order to um, really find out whether your product is, is of interest and of value to, in the customer marketplace, you got to go talk to them. So again, it's to quickly, immediately, rapidly get things done. Um, and you cycle through that so you don't just have one minimum viable product and you're done. You have a whole series and string of minimum viable products to take you to your destination. Um, there's some examples. Some examples here, uh, I'll go through three of these, uh, Airbnb, Uber, and Zappos. They basically show what the minimum viable product was for each of those, and it's kind of stunningly simple on each of those. For Airbnb, uh, the idea came from uh, the guy who started Airbnb, a friend of his from uh, LA, was going up to San Francisco and needed to rent a place to stay, and, and thought maybe he could rent a room in, in the guy's apartment. That was the start of it. So, uh, or at least the conception of the idea. What do you need? You basically needed the website, some photos, and a way uh, to take the reservations. And so you didn't even need a way to collect money. Because people would bring the money with them. You didn't have to do credit card to begin with. So, uh, for Uber, 
What did he need? So met it with an iPhone. That was his, that's who he started with, messaging on the iPhone, and a way to collect the credit card payment. The customer brought himself. So this grew the, that was a minimum viable product. For Zappos, it was shoes, a landing page, and a method to return the shoes. That was, that was that's his business. It's huge now, but that that's basically was the business. He went downstairs, lived in an apartment complex, had a shoe store down in the basement or downstairs. He took pictures of the shoes, put them on the website. People ordered the shoes. He went down, bought the shoe with his credit card from the shoe store downstairs, shipped them off, and uh, that's what the business was born. So um, you'll have a minimum viable product uh, before you have a fully functional product. Again, think back to skateboard versus the automobile. Uh, you, you've got elements of it, but they're not complete. And the learning you get helps drive you to what that fully functional product should be. Perhaps the fully functional product for your customer is not the car, whether it's a bus or it's an airplane. Or, or something, and by doing, by learning incrementally along the way with these minimum viable products, you can actually the, the customer will help help you steer you to what they're going to be interested in buying. <coughs> so, I, I'm, I'm a Triz guy. Are there any Triz people in the room? Deafening silence. I love it. <laughs> uh, it it's an inventive methodology uh, that that uh, is grown and waned in popularity over time. Uh, but one of the principles in it is really cool. Uh, uh, like it, it looks a lot like the previous equation that we saw, which is basically the ideal final result for a product. Uh, is, is basically, it, it maximizes the benefits and minimizes the cost. And so the, the truly ideal product is the problem solves itself without any intervention from anybody, without any uh, expense. You know, the problem just solves itself. That's an ideal result, right? It doesn't happen, so we have to put something in the denominator. Um, but basically, it achieves its purpose. Uh, costs can be money, time, materials, the tangibles that we're used to. can also be down into the frustration level of your user. Uh, and, and it's harder things to measure. And the reason I bring that up is because some of those things are things that need to be measured when you're doing, when you're showing a minimum viable product or testing out a minimum viable product. Uh, you, you know, if you're testing out a program, you do want to test out how many clicks is the guy having to do? Is he getting frustrated? What's the feedback? Uh, and stuff. So, um, this is to describe the ideal customer here. Basically, they're, um, Steve Blank uses the word early evangelist. And what it is, is it's an early adopter, so somebody way on the edge of the bell curve, up there in the top two or three percent, or even half percent, right? So we're talking Six Sigma or, 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 or beyond sometimes, the extreme user. Um, and, but they're visionary enough and they're struggling with a problem. And you're, you're trying to find the guys who are already struggling with the problem you're trying to solve. Um, and, and, so, because then when you, when you meet them, they'll recognize that you've got a solution for them, and they'll be willing to work with you while you refine your solution for them. Um, because they're hurting enough with the problem that you're solving for them. Um, a lot of times they'll have already cobbled together some kind of rat's nest solution for the problem that they're dealing with, and, and your goal is to simplify it for them. Um, and they're going to—they're willing to take a risk with you here. Example here for our uh, uh, for the TechStars startup weekend here. We're going quick. This is good. Okay. We'll give a good time for questions here. Uh, you see, here, here's our team. Um, it's fun. TechStars is a, is a uh, startup incubator. Um, they have these competitions regularly in probably about 50 cities around the world. Uh, every year, and um, we we are, were the only team that did a non-software um, entry 
into the contest. So we were the only team that actually went after making a physical product. Everybody else was going after some kind of program or some kind of website and stuff like that. So we thought, oh gee, we're at way to disadvantage because what can you do with a physical product in a weekend? Um, turns out you do quite a bit. Uh, the premise was the smoke is a buzzkill um, to use uh, the language of, of the day. Um, the, the premise was that the smoke from campfires uh, gets in your eyes, it gets annoying, you, people are always kind of moving around to not have the smoke belonging in their faces and stuff. So the, the, the premise was that the people who have campfires would love to get rid of the smoke blowing in their faces. Um, so, who, who was the intended customer was the campers. And, at least but by the team when we started out. And what do they need? They needed it, they need whatever solution we had to be portable, easy to set up, <coughs> lightweight, um, you know, other qualities that the camper would value, probably maybe disposable, just in case uh, the windstorm came and you know, not too expensive and stuff. So um, we went out and validated with customers. We had drawings, conceptual drawings of, of, of and even just a description. The, the minimum viable product in this case was basically a description of, we've got a device that's gonna take the smoke out of your faces. Isn't that great? And just like with my question to how many of you are familiar with Triz, people responded with deafening silence on that one. Um, turns out campers do that as just part of the experience. <laughs> take it away, you've take, taken half the, half the campfire experience away from them. Um, you go to bed smelling like smoke. You wake up smelling like smoke. Everything smells like smoke when you're done with it, and that's part of the memory. Um, so who was, who, is there a customer? And if so, who? Um, question was that, that people did recognize that smoke's an issue, it's unavoidable, um, and stuff. And then a couple of the places where they went and did surveys uh, were not just camper places where you find campers, but rather places where you'd find homeowners. And so basically here we were wrong uh, with our initial thing. Uh, we did a pivot, is, is the term that we used in the, in the uh, lean startup literature. Um, and that just means we turned around and went and did something different. Um, and who the, the real customer for this type of device would be is in fact the homeowner. Now, why? Well, it turns out there's growing legislation that are, or in, in townhome issues and uh, neighborhood issues where people are, don't like the smoke from their neighbor's fire pit blowing into their houses. And so the people want to use their fire pits. So this is where the growth is. It, it, it is there, and there's a real need because people have the fire pits, they want to have the fire pits, they've got huge amounts invested in their patio with the fire pit. Um, so, but what do they need? There's, their needs are very really different. They want durable. They've got access to other resources. If you wanted to pipe in natural gas to burn off the rest of the smoke, you could do that in, in a household situation. You know, because what, what causes smoke in, in the fire? is incomplete combustion of the fuel. And, and so if you could ingest, inject more oxygen or something at the top of the flames, you'd burn off all that extra soot. And it turns out, uh, well, we'll get there in a minute, sorry. But there is, and this basically, again, what's a pivot? Basically means you, you're testing out a new hypothesis. It, it's, it's a part of the process. You don't fire the team the start of the project because they had to do a pivot. You might end up having to acquire some new skill sets into the team because of the pivot, but you don't go firing them uh, just because they 
found that they had to change the direction they're going in. This turns out to be a commercially available fire pit. Uh, the, the, uh, burns off the, the smoke that it comes in it. And what it does is it's, it's a double channeled or double walled um, drum, basically. Double walled drum. And uses the, the fact that, that if you heat up the air, it's going to rise. And it has it rise, it injects it towards the top of the flame, uh, more air, and uh, that, that ends up burning up most of the smoke that comes out of it and so you look at this though and you say where's my fire all i'm seeing is a big drum and there's a little fire inside it so the team's hypothesis and this is as far as the team got to, to be honest was if we could throw something into the fire they did the same thing but you now built the fire around uh, that that would be uh, a good solution to it and uh, not only, so to show you again, this is not necessarily proof of concept, that the, that the concept functionally works, but rather that the customer is proof of the customer, that the customer wants it. And it was such that the team that went out, the team, our, our team that went out talking to customers, they were saying, I would buy that. If I could buy that today, I would buy that. And they actually took down phone numbers and email addresses. And between the pivot that we did and the, e and the addresses that we had of people that had signed up, that's what won the contest, what won the, won, won the, uh, won the startup weekend thing. Because it, it was both significant learning, change, and recognition of the, 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 the real interest. Um, came up with a process, you know, there's a, there's a full design behind this, actually. We had a, two, two mechanical engineers on the team. Um, kind of our team, and uh, in, we're already at the conclusion of the talk. Uh, and uh, what, what you really want to make sure of is, is that that each step of the way, your minimum viable product is viable in some sort, in some sense. That it, 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 it delivers some viability, some, via, some value to the customer each step of the way. Uh, it can be very incremental. You also want to make sure your, your experiments that you're doing with your customer are uh, piecewise um, understandable so that you're not confounding too many variable changes all at once. Um, just like with the experimental method, when you do an experiment, you want to change your variables in a controlled manner so that you can learn from those changes. Um, and the third item is basically you, want to, you should expect to pivot pretty much on any business you ever start. start. Uh, either the path to that business is going to be different than what you thought. The business model will be different. Um, the skill sets might be different that, that are needed, but uh, something significant is going to change. And if it doesn't, you might ask yourself how, how if you've talked to enough customers yet. Um, this is elements of, of that the we as inventors typically have is is that I've got a great idea, I know it's a great idea, I'm gonna develop it or take it to the market, and then you take it to the market and it doesn't necessarily um, make the impact that the show would have at, at the time. So the, the, the thing to do is uh, get your idea out there in small bites. So I'll take questions now. Rolf, maybe just if you could, if you go back to the slide in your project there, right before you pivoted, okay. where you went out to the stores. Yes. Yeah. So I think everybody probably was listening and picked up on that and probably knows as much as, or more about lean as I do. But one of the key things here is that, you know, they didn't go out and show their, you didn't show them a concept here. Mm -hmm. You didn't say, you like my idea. 
they went out and talked about the problem. Right. That. Right. All right. Do you have a problem with smoke in campfires out when you're camping out in the woods and hiking and everything else? Is and, and they identified and discovered though that most people were, didn't have a problem if they were camping out. You know that was their target audience. So they didn't give their you didn't give your idea away here, but you went out and really validated how big is this problem and what are our assumptions yeah. and. Um, and that's something, certainly, as we develop our product concepts, it's so easy to get enamored with our idea. We start developing it, and we're afraid to share it. But the point of lean is you really don't have to share your idea. You just have, you can talk about the problem <laughs> from the problem that you exists. solve. Yeah. And yeah. from that, you can learn so much, really without spending any money at all, hardly. Right. Uh, just a little bit of time and the courage to go talk to strangers uh, out in stores or wherever it may be that you can track these folks down. But yeah, so that's right. kind of a, a key point and that led to your pivot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, yeah. very, very good insight. It's, it's, to, it's, it's validation of the problem, not the product specifically. I was just going to say this really is a case uh, in your example of a solution in search of a problem. And it was in a place you didn't think it was. You had a solution. The problem wasn't campfires for campers. The problem was like home but, but, but the overall problem still was smoke. But, yeah. Yeah. Yes. But but but, the, but, but yes, you're right. You're, you're, you're having a point there. It was, yeah. it was really kind of looking for where is the customer base for the solution. Yeah. 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 Yes. I was going to mention to you when I with my invention inventing, doing it the market research. Many times I'll go out there, like you're doing here, and say, what if the problem can be resolved this way? I've done this with my battery without telling what I was doing. I said, what if you could have a battery that you never have to, you, you never have to replace. All you do is put something, put something up against it and, and recharge again. You never have to buy batteries again. Would that be a product your store could sell? I went to Sears Roebuck one time a couple of years ago in, in Chicago and met with their, one of the merchandise managers. He says, it can't be done. I says, well, what if it could be done? He says, well, I'd buy, I'd buy every battery you could supply me. Well, see, then you know, that was just kind of a research. You know, I said, look at, you know, there's a market out there. So, you know, but that's what you're talking about here. But without telling what the product is, just see if, if what this idea, if I could do this from this, would you buy it? Would you market it? Yes. Uh, was the customer validation then uh, customers of these particular stores, or did that was it more for potential customers of your product? And you were also asking store managers and you know workers. Of in, in this case, they were just actually talking to people out in the parking lots. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. It was it was a quick kind of dart in, dart out. Mm -hmm. Kind of research, so uh, it, it, two of the stores actually got permission from the management, to, from the store managers to, to ask questions, and a couple of them they just kind of did a quick dart in, dart out. Kind of. Well, uh, and went up it. Was, was there uh, was there any resistance on the team to the pivot? Um, um, was there any like a, like emotional reluctance? There were some members perhaps saying, "No, we need to stick with the original conception." Um, Actually, not in this case because the evidence was pretty clear uh, that, that basically there wasn't a problem. And then when we did some searching on the internet, we were able to confirm that in fact there's Facebook things you can find, and, and there's newspaper articles you can find about this smoke blowing into your neighbor's house and how that's getting more regulated. And, and once we had confirmation of that, it was like, okay, there's our market. You could picture a scenario where the people who were originally developing it were really into solving sort of an outdoors-ish problem, kind of a problem that you would have camping. Yeah. And you get out of that world into the world of the condos or whatever. They're not interested anymore. So that, you could picture that that as being a resistance factor. Yeah, that's a full possibility, and, and it, it pivots. 
sometimes wipe out a company because it's no longer interesting to the people who are solving the problem. You know, you know. But then that's a good thing. But that's why that's why startups are temporary organizations and, and why you try to learn quickly on them so that you don't spend two years on something that you're then going to fold. You spend two weeks on it and then fold it and then work with it that you learned. Yes? Did you explore the people who might have already been in the marketplace and making a competing product? Yeah, that's where the, the picture I showed of what the other this this so that was the is best a competitor. competitor. That's okay. the best competitor. That, that's about a two hundred dollar, two hundred fifty dollar type of product. Uh, it, it, I don't think it comes with all the brickwork. It's basically the, the structure, and then you got to get it styled and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So yes, I came across I think similar product like the one you're showing here. It was more like a fossil fuel, uh, you say stove. And, okay. And they were doing the same thing. They were using, you know, putting more oxygen pumping so that uh, yeah. the soup decreases. They are also using at the same time using the thermal energy for thermal electrical effects to recharge your cell phones. Oh. So they say if you are going okay. on a camping yeah. or somewhere, you can yeah. use the heat generated in the pit and convert it into a yeah. simple, yeah. you know, peltier uh, plate. Okay. And convert it into uh, electricity. And you can charge your cell, cell phones too. But they're wondering how this thing works and how you secure your idea, which is basically for a typical application. I mean, the idea is you know, it can be used for, you know, for, for a cooking a stove, it can be used for something like this. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. your, your ones, how do you protect that thing? In patent, I mean. Oh, so you're asking how do you patent? Yeah. The uh, differentiator that is different. Yeah, the well, what you're identifying here is additional problems that you're solving, and those those would probably take different patents. Probably it, it, it is my guess. Um, I'm not a patent attorney, um, but I do know that the, the patent office tends to break out inventions if you have too many different. Uh, primary type claims in, in the patent application. And um, there's always going to be brainstorming you want to do. What other things can be done with this? Um, you know, this is not the substitute for thinking. Um, it's, it's just a way to confirm that your customer really has a problem. Yeah. So you can take out what you're saying here. And, and go talk to the customer. How how, how much is, is this pay for you with this with your cell phone? Okay, it, it is it it does hurt. You want to have your cell phone charged when you wake up in the morning. And it would be great if the dying fire could could charge your cell phone. Um, then you start to get to ask some questions. How much money would you pay for that? And that might help confirm or deny the path you've got in mind. So with the minimum viable product, you've got, uh, you're basically proving something as viable. And then once you have those results, is there like a set of rules or procedures that scale that up to be successful? That's beyond the scope of my okay. desire to go here right now, or, or ability. Okay. I mean, that, that's where you have to bring in the business people. That's where you have to bring in, uh, you know, a, a full business team. Uh, and and it, additionally, you got to see if you got a technically viable solution as well. Sure. Is that the question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh, well, what do you do next? Now you yeah, have a viable product. Yeah. What do you do next? Now you can start getting. Now you can start investing in it. Okay. Like you might typically do before. You know, we, 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 let's say what's typically done is people invest a lot into the two years of effort on a program and then show it off and then find out nobody cares or maybe somebody does care, you're lucky, but you know, you, you might find out nobody cares. And so this is the way to find out in a few weeks, uh, does somebody care in the market for your thing. An example that, uh, that you gave, Rolf, with the Zappo shoes, so again, uh, you know, if you have an idea that you can sell shoes online, 
you could go out and set up an e-commerce site and buy a lot of shoes and wait for customers to come. Or if you use Lean, again, you go down, uh, you find a couple of shoe stores nearby, you take pictures of their products and explain you're going to try and sell them and you want to, you, you know, take pictures, you get pictures, you post those out on an inexpensive web page that was a minimal cost and you see if customers will actually <coughs> purchase the shoes and when they do you trot downstairs and put the labor into packing those up and sending them off. It's not a, it's not a business model that you would, you know, as a, to, to sustain that wave because it would never pay for itself, but you know if you discover that there's a market there, obviously then you can invest and find investors that are going to build the website and you know build that business model. So now you're confident that you've got something worth investing in, whether it's your own money or investors' money. Right. But now you've got a story to tell to really get that, and you spent you've done this in a matter of three months for a few hundred dollars and a chunk of your time, and you know you know if you've got something you need to pivot and. You can move on to your next idea if there isn't a market for it versus if you sink the $30,000 and two years into your idea, then your ability to pivot and do something different diminishes oftentimes. And your emotional attachment. Yeah, you say, old man. In, 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 two, in two years, you're emotionally attached to your yeah. the approach you've picked. Yeah, right. Whereas you might have identified the right problem with the wrong approach. Yep. Yep. So we were talking about Target a little while ago. Is Target in the midst of pivoting right now? I think they're stumbling myself. <laughs> they may, they're, they're changing. They're trying yes. to change. Yeah. Damn this internet activity. Yeah. <laughs> so one of, the, uh, one of the questions would be kind of there's an al maybe alternative approaches instead of going and buying a pair of shoes and then shipping them mm -hmm. on your website you could put a you know a little api call in there to do a drop ship order to a shoe factory that, that, that could be your next the, step the, uh, yeah yes yep. you know, yep. there's that, a lot like of the next pretty much every product. pretty much every store or every online store has an api that you can, you know, your website can call. Yep. Today you could do that, you know. When yeah, that's that true. Yeah. 20 years, years ago, ago that wasn't there, but. Yeah, uh, yeah. But no, you're right. There are alternative yeah. ways to, better ways to do a minimal viable yeah. concept than others. Yeah. Uh, and you need to explore that. Yes. And those are all ones along the path. I mean, the first one was you went downstairs and bought shoes. Yeah. And mailed them off to the person that, that ordered them. You know, and, and then each minimal viable product improves. You mentioned you get to a fully functional one. I was going to mention, I don't know how many people today read the paper on Amazon that you're going to, yeah. you'll be able to buy clothes and then turn them back in and get the, and, and then off the rack, uh, pick out something else. Mm. Well, mm. I checked out Amazon today, went on their website and found out they researched this several years ago with customers to see why would you, if you, if you could buy a new set of clothes, when you get done with them, just wash them, send them in to us, and then pick out another set of clothes and send them out to you. But they had done that. Now, here's today in the paper, a big announcement, you know, what they're doing. And, but it is, they're going to put the department stores out of business. But they did the research a couple, several years ago, what you're talking about. And then they saw that, hey, there's a market. Well, let's do something about it. And they're going to send you the clothes in a drone. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> At any point, did anybody say what is smoke and how do we get rid of it? Or no, 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 that, that wasn't. That was. We just fumbled until we found a, comp, a, mm -hmm. a product that we could emulate and sell for cheaper. Uh, oh, 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 okay. At, at the beginning, I, I, as the chemical engineer, had to educate the team what smoke was. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's there's a lot of business people on the team, two mechanical engineers that, that, that kind of knew what was going on, but uh, the other four were non-scientists, and, and yeah, needed needed some explanation as to what what smoke is, where it comes from, why it's there, um, and, how and how to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. So, 
Well, and on Bob's question or comment there, Amazon was basically a minimal viable startup. Will people buy books online? You know, and eight hundred. Yeah, yeah well, okay, eight hundred. So I mean, you know, it was a minimal viable kind of concept of, and then of course, you know, the answer was yes, and we have Amazon today. <laughs> kind of on the, um, I think Zappos um, is part was partially owned by Amazon. Correct. Yeah. Yes. And uh, you know, back to the Zappos story, I think you know the answer to the question, what do you do next? Well, the model he had was somebody's placed an order for shoes, now i got to go find these shoes and send them to them. So he would go down to the shoe store right underneath where he lived, and he wouldn't get a deal or anything. So he would, he would buy the shoes, send them out, collect money, and what was missing? The profit margin. So, but he knew that. He knew that up front. He wasn't an idiot. Right. So, he's, so that's what he has to do next, is figure out how to not only fulfill the shoe order, but to fulfill it profitably. So maybe the next thing you do is you go to that shoe store owner and say, hey, I can do a lot of this for you. Uh, how about just give me like 30%, okay? Just cut me a check. I'll fulfill it. Instead of you making your 50% margin, just cut me a check for 30%. That might be like the next step in this sort of thing. And then eventually, you're moving on and um, actually establishing relationships with the shoe companies and possibly opening a warehouse, buying the shoes direct, um, that sort of thing. So, you know, but that, that I guess is yeah. the next thing is how, right. how, how do you make money, how do you scale it so you can make money? Yeah. What do you tweak? What's your pivot now? Yeah. Um, but he didn't care whether he made money initially, he just needed to see if people would buy a pair of shoes over the internet, and basically what was list price, and if you go on Zappos to this day, uh, virtually all their shoes are at list price, and so, um, but there's a big selection. Yeah. Any final questions before I prematurely cut us over there? Okay, yes. When you're speaking to people, do you have any kind of qualification for the difference between what people say they would do, like the joke in UX, <laughs> like when you stand outside of a bathroom and ask people, did they wash their hands, they'll always say yes. Mm. That when the questioner says, would you buy this, they're trying to be nice, or you know, you don't have necessarily the qualified yeah. data that they would really buy it. Right. Uh, how do you, do you have any kind of way of balancing that in your, in your evaluation of do they want me? You got that. Yeah, I think it's basically, I think if you're asking, it's sort of the difference between asking uh, intent that you get back on a survey versus actual behavior. That's what he's going to do when they're in that situation. For example, washing your hands. Well, like, you built it like, based oh, yeah. on that, did it yeah. ever backfire? Yeah. You know, right. Did that ever right. have a hole in it? Yeah. But the key of minimal viable to lean is you don't ask someone, yeah. will, you, will you buy my it's idea? Not a survey. You know, you ask what problems, we have, we, here's a problem or a solution we have in this product area. You know, now you can charge your flashlight without ever taking your batteries out of it. Uh, and, you know, you can just yeah. put my device next to it. Um, or do you have a problem with smoke uh, when you're out camping? People can, people will talk a lot about their problems. Uh, and they're pretty valid, whether it's your relative or a friend or a stranger. But as soon as I ask somebody, do you like my idea? Um, you know, it's kind of like your wife saying, how do I look tonight? Um, you know, you don't even, and that's the extreme case that you that good isn't valid. But, because we all know the answer to that. But, but if you ask someone a question about, do you like this? How is my book? How is this? How is that? Our personality takes over and we try to please, we try to be right, and we try to look good, and, and we're pretty, you know, dealt generally. And so it's very hard to get good information when you, and that's the failure of traditional research. A key challenge is, you know, they get these buy intent scores that are sort of very misleading often, and, and they lead to a lot of product failures in large companies. Yeah. The, the way I've seen that dealt with on uh, over the internet type of things is 
they'll actually set up the web pages so you could buy the product. Mm -hmm. It's like the actual thing. But when you do, when you click on the buy now button or the buy button, it says sorry, we're currently out of stock. Mm -hmm. Sure. And right. ask you to sign and ask for your email address. Yeah. And sign up. We'll let you know when it's in stock. Yep. Yep. You know, and, and so that's one way they try to get around that. Oh yeah, you've got a great product. Yeah. You know, uh, well, the, the Google look, are you using machine learning or anything to yeah. track their purchases and see yeah. what they would really use it for? Yeah. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I, I've got to tell you, it happened with me today. Uh, I, I got a Mercedes, so I called up Sears Motors over here because I got 10,000 miles on it. I says, say, I heard that I can go 10,000 miles on oil change. I got to make an appointment. He says, you don't have to make an appointment. I says, what do you mean? He says, your Mercedes will go 20,000 on an oil change. I says, you've got to be a kid. He says, no, we were part of the research. Mercedes came to us and says, look it. If we could develop an oil that could go 20,000 miles, would you would, would would that be resistance to get you? No, he said that could sell cars. Mm -hmm. So Mercedes has their own oil right now that'll go 20,000 miles on an oil change. And I found that out today, and I said, now I've heard everything. Mm -hmm. Rapid oil change, you're out of business. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that they did the research and found out that this would help sell cars right. if they'd go a 20,000 mile oil change and develop oil to do it. Synthetic? Synthetic, oh yeah, it's synthetic. <laughs> <laughs> I have one last. Okay, yes. Maybe it's the last one. Okay. Um, I mean, thank you very much for this, because it's, everything you say is so intuitive. You know, it, it absolutely makes sense, but when you're in the process of developing something yourself, maybe you don't see it yourself. <laughs> Probably with the exception of pivoting. I think that's a really good insight that's not necessarily so intuitive. And mm -hmm. I think it's probably yeah. the case. Mm -hmm. But I understand you work for 3M. You work for a yeah. very big yeah. company. Yeah. And I mean, many of us, I have worked for large corporations as well. And large corporations, I mean, history is littered with examples where they put years of development into something that is a complete flaw. I mean, we all know that. So uh, I mean, in 3M, presumably, they're using this. This starting to now. Okay. Actually, the reason I got into studying lean as intensively as I did was because of the history of flops at 3M. Yeah. Um, so we'll let that be, be that. It, it, basically, there, there's, <laughs> what you say about large corporations is very true, and um, you know, it, it, it's and it's very hard to run a true lean startup team within a large company. Uh, it, it's really hard to keep people management from trying to meddle in it, or yep. teams, yeah, help. No, help, management help, wants to yeah, yeah. help. They, they, they want to help. Um, they, they want to ensure that the problem is, is con they, they, there's a strong confirmation bias. Yeah. That, that I mean, the, you've really answered companies. my question, which yeah. is how would you do this in a big corporation? Yeah because you have so many different, if you're an individual or a small team, it's very easy because you have the kind of, um, uh, the discipline of impending failure always. Right. But in a big corporation, that's kind of quite low down on yeah. the list of priorities. I can just say my experience at 3M, the way they dealt with it was by having many small bets. I mean, typically one person might be on two projects or have two of their own projects, basically. So in a group of 30, you might have 50 projects going on, rather than 50 people working on one project. So that, that, that's how they chose to do it. Yes. Sorry, I see a hand here and a hand here, so it's two. It, it didn't take me long uh, working in a large company to uh, not to to ask for permission to do something. <coughs> so I got to the point where I would do it first and then ask for permission. Yeah. And then told why it wasn't why it wouldn't work and then I tell them what I did. Yeah, I don't know if that helps or not. Yeah. That's the classic profile. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry, okay. the questions are increasing in number. <laughs> I don't believe. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, we'll Mine's just a comment. Okay, sure. 
I, um, I, my experience has been the big corporations don't bother to look down the road because they think if they go down there and it's not where they want to be, they'll move the road. <laughs> Whereas yeah. the rest of us have to follow the road wherever yeah. it goes. Yeah. So we have to be careful. So I think big corporations are finding the roads aren't moving towards them. They're, they're doing a lot more active. I mean, even Amazon's buying. They're all huge. Big, they're all making huge acquisitions. Yeah. Well, like what Medtronic will do, for example, is they'll put seed money out into these little startups, mm -hmm. find the one that takes off, and then buy that. Yeah, yeah. But the one, the one thing that I question, I have like, like a lot of times in science, you get this kind of a serendipitous effect where you're, sol you, you're testing a hypothesis and you discover a mystery in that test. You know, it doesn't quite go the way you wanted, but you find another, you open up a whole another can of worms as a result, a whole another set of, whole another set of area for science. Yeah, endeavor. that's the process of discovery. Yeah, the, yeah, the, uh, totally yeah, the accidental the discovery. Yeah. yeah, and I'm wondering how often that, you know, is there in the lean kind of culture, if you will, is there is that a cornerstone of that, or is that kind of not being familiar enough with lean, you know, kind of the serendipitous uh, discovery of a new market, for example? I, I, I think serendipity is is basically it, 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 it happens, mm -hmm. but it's not it's hard to plan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and so yeah. Being that it's hard to plan, it's hard to put on. The that's the key thing. Is that let's it's not planned. Week. Let's learn this this week. Yeah. You know. That's the key thing. When you come across the discovery, then it leads you to a whole bunch of questions. Yeah. But. Uh, I, well, sort of like planning for a software bug. You know, you don't have the, you don't have the bug, but you ha you have the contingency that if this bug occurs, if a bug occurs, then you can. Here's the process we do for fixing it. Yeah, and, and we ensure we have manpower around. Yeah. Can tackle things like that. Yeah, the only uh, side comment I made, or additional comment I make there is that with Lean, I think the team is what steeped in curiosity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So because of that, I think they're probably more likely to observe and and be attuned to you know variances or serendipity and whether it fits into the scope of what they can use, but they would catalog it, be aware of it, and consider it whether it leads to a pivot or a different project or whatever, but the curiosity is there, so they're gonna Yeah, they're okay, gonna yeah, pay a it, it, Not every product is is the, the you don't want to take lean principles to every product. Or every development. Let's go that way. I would not have had the Apple II computer. Well, let's give Ralph a big hand. <laughs>